Across Blackwater Bay on Dragonstone, Raina Targaryen found a new grief awaiting when returning from Storm's End. Her daughter, Arya, had become a terror, a wild child who defied her mother and her maesters, and abused her servants, and generally being difficult all at court. Her husband, Andrew Farman, was less vocal and openly defiant, but was also no less angry. When word had first reached Dragonstone that Queen Alyssa was dying, Andro had announced he would accompany his wife as his place was at Raina's side. But she refused him. However, harshly, an argument had preceded her departure, and Raina was heard to say that the wrong farmer had run away. Their marriage was never passionate, but had now become a mama's farce by 54 AC. Andro Farmer's discontent on Dragonstone only grew worse after his sister's departure. Lady Alyssa had been his only friend, and Raina found it hard to accept that he played no role in his sister stealing three dragon eggs. Andro had asked her to appoint him commander of the castle garrison, but Raina only laughed at the idea. When she flew to King's Landing to inform King Jaehaerys of the theft of the dragon eggs, Andro had offered to accompany her. His wife refused him scornfully, telling him, what could he possibly do but fall off the dragon? Autumn had come to Dragonstone, as to the rest of Westeros, and with it came the cold winds from the north and the storms from the south, raging up the narrow sea. A darkness settled over the ancient fortress, a gloomy place even in the summer. Even the dragons seemed to feel the damp. As the year waned, the sickness came to Dragonstone. It was not the sweating sickness, nor the shaking sickness, nor grayscale. The first sign was blood pouring from orifices, followed by terrible cramping in the gut. There were a number of diseases that could be the cause, Maester Culliper told Rayner. Which of them might be to blame, he never determined, as Culliper himself was the first to die less than two days after he began to feel ill. Maester Anselm, who took his place, thought his age was to blame. Many of Rayner's trusted friends followed. Castella Sutton was next, then set to marry him sickened, and Elaine Royce, then Sam Stokeworth, who liked to boast that she had never been sick a day in her life. All three died the same night, within an hour of one another. Raina Targaryen herself remained untouched, though her friends were being felled one by one. It was maybe her Valyrian blood that saved her. Males also seemed largely immune to this plague, aside from Maester Caliper. Only women were struck down. Queen Raina ordered the gates of Dragonstone closed, as yet there was no sickness beyond the walls, and she meant for it to stay that way, to protect the small folk. When she sent word to King's Landing, Jaehaerys acted at once, commanding Lord Valerian to send his galleys to make sure no one escaped to spread the pestilence beyond the island. When Andro Farman saw Raina weep at the loss of her dear friends, he asked her, you weep for them, but would you weep for me? His words woke a fury in the Queen, lashing him across the face. Raina commanded him to leave her, declaring that she wanted to be alone. Andro told her that she shall be, as all her friends were dead. In her grief, Raina did not realise what happened. It was Rigo Drats, the King's Pentoshi Master of Coin, who first gave voice to suspicions when King Jaehaerys assembled his small council to discuss the deaths on Dragonstone. Reading over accounts, Lord Rigo furrowed his brow and proclaimed that it was no sickness, that it was the tears of lease, poison, much to the shock of the king. Such things were no more in the free cities, Draz assured the king. The old maester would have seen it soon enough, so he had to be the first to die. Rigo said that's how he'd do it. It was brought up that only women were struck down, but the answer was simple. Only women got the poison. When Septon Barth and Grand Maester Benefer concurred with Lord Rigo's observation, the king dispatched a raven to Dragonstone. Once Rain Targaryen read his words, she had no doubts. Summoning the captain of her guards, she commanded that her husband be found and brought to her. Andro Farman was not to be found in his bedchamber, nor the Queen's, nor the Great Hall, nor the stables, nor the Sept, nor in Aegon's garden. In the Sea Dragon Tower, in the Maester's chambers under the rookery, they discovered Maester Alsom dead, with a dagger between his shoulder blades. With the gates closed and barred, there was no way to leave the castle, save by dragon. But Rainer felt Andro did not have the courage for that. Andro was found in the chamber of the painted table, a longsword in his hand. He made no attempt to deny the poisonings. Instead, he boasted of his actions as revenge for the way he was treated by all of them. He found he was nothing more than a cupbearer rather than the man he could have been. The father, the lord, the swordsman. Andro laughed at the idea they all drank the poison willingly and laughed at him for being nothing but a cupbearer. Raina did not give him the joy of a reply. Instead, she told her guard to geld him, feed him to the dragons, slowly, bit by bit. As they moved towards him, Andro shouted that his wife can fly, and so could he. He slashed ineffectively at the nearest man, back to the window behind him, and leapt out to his death.
Afterward, Reynard Targaryen had his body hacked to pieces and fed to her dragon. Andro Farman was the last noticeable death of 54 AC, but there was still more ill to come in the terrible year of the stranger. Just as a stone thrown into a pond would send out ripples in all directions, the evil that Andro Farman had brought would spread across the land, touching and twisting the lives of others, long after the dragons were done feasting on his blackened, smoked remains. The first ripple was felt in the small council when Lord Damon Valerian announced his intent to step down as Hand of the King. The King's mother had been Lord Damon's sister and his young niece among the women poisoned on Dragonstone. It's also fair to think his advancing age and desire to spend his remaining days with his children and grandchildren on Driftmark were the cause of his departure as well. Jaehaerys' first thought to look to the small council for a new hand. Alban Massey Rigo Drats and Septon Bath had all shown themselves to be men of great ability, earning the king's trust, but none of them were suitable. Septon Bath was suspected of having greater loyalty to the starry set than the Iron Throne. Also, he was of very low birth, and the lords of the realm would not allow the son of a blacksmith to be the king's right hand. Lord Rigo was a godless Pentoshi, and his birth was, if anything, lower than Septon Bath. Lord Albin was crippled and considered by many as sinister. Even he acknowledged he struck a villainous figure. There could be no question of bringing back Rhaegar Baratheon or any of King Maegor's surviving hands. Lord Tully's term upon the council during the Regency had been undistinguished. Roderick Arryn, Lord of the Eyrie, was a boy of ten. Jaehaerys had recently reached an understanding with Donald Hightower, but still did not wholly trust him. No more than he did Lyman Lannister. Bertrand Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden, was known to be a drunk. Alaric Stark was best left in Winterfell, being seen as a stubborn man, stern and unforgiving. He would make for an uncomfortable presence at the council table. It would also be unthinkable to bring an Iron Man to King's Landing. With none of the great lords of the realm suitable, Jaehaerys turned to the abandonment. It was desirable that the hand be an older man whose experience would balance the king's youth. As the council included several learned men, a warrior was wanted, a man tested in battle. After a dozen names had been put forward, the choice fell to Sir Miles Smallwood, Lord of Acorn Hall in the Riverlands, who had fought for the king's brother, Aegon the Uncrowned, beneath the god's eye, battled what the hero at Stonebridge, and ridden with the late Lord Stokeworth, bringing Harren the Red to justice during the reign of King Aenys. Lord Miles wore the scars of a dozen savage fights upon his face and body. Sir William the Wasp of the Kingsguard, who had served at Aegon Hall, swore there was no finer, fiercer, or more leal lord in all the Seven Kingdoms. Jaehaerys gave his assent. A raven took wing, and within the fortnight, Lord Mars was on his way to the King's Landing. Queen Nellisan played no part in the selection of the King's Hand. Whilst the King and the Council were deliberating, she was absent from King's Landing, having flown her dragon Silverwing to Dragonstone to be with her sister Raina and comfort her in her grief. Raina Targaryen was not a woman easily comforted. The loss of so many of her close friends had plunged her into a deep depression. The mention of Andro Farman provoked fits of rage. Far from welcoming her younger sister, she tried to send her away, even screaming at the queen in view of all. When Alassane refused to go, Raina retreated to her own chambers and barred the door, emerging only to eat, and hardly at that. Alassane Targaryen set about restoring order to Dragonstone. A new maester was sent for, a new captain appointed, as well as new scepter, shunned by her sister, the queen turned to her niece, only to find rage and rejection. Princess Arya did not seem to care about the deaths or her mother. When Alassane tried to share the stories of her own childhood and told of how Raina had put dragon eggs into her cradle and cared for her as if she was her own mother, Arya said she never even gave her a dragon egg, that she just gave her away and flew off to Fair Isle. Alassane's love for her own daughter, Princess Daenerys provoked Arya to anger as well. She asked her aunt why Princess Daenerys should one day be queen and that she should not be a queen. It was then that Arya broke down into tears at last, pleading with Alassane to take her back to King's Landing and the life she loved. Moved by the girl's tears, Queen Alassane could do no more than to promise to take the matter up with her mother. When Queen Raina emerged from her chambers to take a meal, she rejected the notion out of hand. The same night, Raina summoned Arya to her chambers to berate her and the sounds of mother and daughter shouting at one another rang throughout the castle. The princess refused to speak to Queen Alassane after that. The queen finally returned to King's Landing to the arms of King Jaehaerys and the merry laughter of her own daughter, Princess Daenerys. Things were going well in King's Landing. The new hand had arrived and a tourney was about to take place to market. Lord Rigo's taxes had allowed for a near completion of the dragon pit, but all of that was thrown into disarray. When Rhaenyra Targaryen arrived from Dragonstone, she landed hard in the Red Keep on Dreamfire almost starting a fight with the other dragons. She jumped off her dragon, storming into the Red Keep. Princess Arya was gone. She had fled Dragonstone as dawn broke, stealing into the yards and claiming a dragon for her own. Not just any dragon, 
Valerian the Black Dread, Aegon the Conqueror's dragon. For the first time in her life, Reyna Targaryen seemed scared for her daughter and the danger she was in. She was desperate to know where her mad child might have fled. Her first thought had been King's Landing. Arya had been so eager to return to court, but if she was not there, she did not know where to look. The king pointed out that Valerian is too big to hide or pass unnoticed, and he had a fearsome appetite. If any man in Westeros should so much as glimpse Valerian or his niece, he told his maesters he wanted to be told at once. The ravens flew, but there was no word of Princess Arya that day or the day after, or the day after that. Reyna remained at the Red Keep all the while, sometimes raging, sometimes shaking, sometimes drinking sweet wine to sleep. Princess Daenerys was so frightened by her aunt that she cried whenever it came into her presence. After seven days, Raina declared that she could no longer sit aside. She mounted Dreamfire and was gone. Neither mother nor daughter was seen or heard of again during what little remained of that cruel year.